good morning good evening uh, everyone uh, warm welcome to uh, the asia let's partnership webinar on uh, the readiness framework for green bonds a warm welcome to all of you uh, today we have with us about uh, 45 uh, participants partners uh, government national government representatives and uh, of course panelists and speakers thank you all very much for uh, joining us today on this webinar uh, on green bonds the uh, asia led partnership uh, is happy to uh, run this as a series of uh, webinars and workshops that we are conducting as part of the uh, community of practice uh, on uh, ndc finance more about that a little later uh, just to give you a brief introduction of uh, who the asia led partnership is and uh, who our speakers are more importantly today uh, let us take a look at uh, the agenda for uh, today's webinar. We uh, would give you a brief introduction, like I said, of uh, the LEDS Global Partnership and the Asia LEDS Partnership. Uh, we have with us uh, three esteemed speakers, uh, Ms. Alexia Kelly, who is co-chair of uh, the LEDS Global Partnership uh, Finance Working Group. Uh, Ms. Alexia Kelly is also the founder and CEO of Electric Capital Management and serves as the co-chair of the uh, Global Partnerships uh, Finance Working Group. Uh, Alexia has been working for over 13 years uh, on uh, several topics in, at the intersection of policy and finance, and uh, her experience lies uh, with uh, clean energy uh, transition to clean energy economy, working with governments, nonprofits, philanthropies, corporations, uh, etc. She has uh, ex experience working as a clim senior climate change advisor and uh, foreign service officer with the U.S. Department of State, and has also worked with uh, the David and Lucille Packard Foundation, uh, with the World Resources Organization, and the Climate Trust. So. Um, Alexia brings with her a wealth of experience in this field. Thank you very much for Alexia. Uh, thank you very much to Alexia for joining us today. We have uh, Mr. Mehul Patwari, who is Director of Sustainable Finance South Pole Group, who is with us as well. He brings with him over 20 years of uh, experience in infrastructure and uh, investment development, uh, with experience in uh, designing projects, implementing projects, structuring them, financial structuring, looking at the policy landscape, market-based instruments, incentive mechanisms, etc. Today, he would uh, speak to us about uh, why green bonds, how, how do they work well for uh, sovereign subnational entities, and uh, what does the city do to issue green bonds, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much, Mehul, for joining us today. We have uh, bringing in uh, the crux and uh, the examples uh, something that we are all very interested in seeing on how exactly these green bonds work where do they work how do they work and uh, what is it uh, that ensures the success of green bonds uh, we have mr sandeep bhattacharya who is the india program manager for the climate bonds initiative who will be speaking uh, to us today on uh, all these topics so thank you very much sandeep for joining us and uh, the uh, way we go about uh, the webinar today, uh, after an introductory presentation, uh, we would hand over to each of our panelists. We would have a series of questions that can be asked by the uh, participants after each presentation. But uh, for more on that, uh, if I could request my colleague Anandan to uh, give a brief uh, on the housekeeping rules for this particular webinar, please. Uh, hello, everyone. Warm welcome for today's presentation. Here are the quick housekeeping rules for today. So for most part of the um, session, the participants will be in mute mode. At the end of each presentation, we will have a uh, short Q&A session. Uh, you are requested to raise hands so that we will unmute specific uh, participants so that you can ask questions. You can also type in the questions using chat box at any point of time. And when you are uh, asking question um, for a different speaker, you can just indicate the speaker's name and under handout section at the bottom you can download today's presentation and uh, yeah if you have any technical difficulties you can please let us know using the chat option thank you yeah anandan uh, for uh, participants who may be new to this uh, uh, to the webinar and to the software uh, where exactly do they uh, raise hands virtually uh, so the the option is uh, very much visible there uh, so there is a hand uh, symbol that people can see. So they just have to click that uh, option. Um, so there is a rising, there is a hand option. 
in the go to webinar they just have to click on to that so we will uh, get the notification all right perfect that works well okay so uh, without uh, further ado i would uh, just give a brief introduction and uh, to the hls partnership to the uh, community of practice uh, just to give you a sense of uh, who we are and why we are doing this and uh, then we move on to the actual track of the presentation so if i may have the uh, introductory presentation please thank you so uh, just to introduce myself i'm uh, saumya chaturvedula i'm the lead manager for the asia let's partnership uh, with uh, ICLI offices in uh, asia uh, our parent organization is ICLI local governments for sustainability we are a membership organization that works with uh, subnational entities uh, with regional entities and with national governments uh, on everything to do with sustainable development and uh, furthering sustainable development, raising ambitions and working towards uh, furthering implementation and uh, today focusing on uh, large scale implementation and financing of large scale implementation of sustainable development. That's who uh, ICLI uh, Local Governments for Sustainability is. I come from the South Asia office, which is based out of Delhi, but uh, the three ICLI offices in Asia, which is the ICLI South Asia office in Delhi, the Southeast Asia office in Manila and the East Asia Secretariat out of Seoul together host uh, the Asia LEDS partnership. The uh, LEDS partnership is a voluntary regional network. Uh, it exists to promote uh, low emission development strategies in Asia to help uh, plan and to help finance and to help implement. We work with a range of members, uh, with government entities, with non-government entities, with uh, technical partners, with independent experts who are all part of uh, the membership. Our membership is about uh, 100, uh, 1100 plus strong. Uh, we have 45 government agencies from 14 Asian countries who are part of the membership. And uh, this is a regional membership. There are uh, similar uh, regional networks, uh, regional partnerships in uh, Africa, in Latin America. And uh, the LEDS Global Partnership, which coordinates all the uh, regional partnerships is uh, currently hosted by the GIZ within this, their SPA program, SPA being the Support of Paris Agreement program, of, uh, which is funded by the BMU. So uh, the GIZ uh, holds the uh, Secretariat of the LEDS Global Partnership, and we have the uh, regional secretariats under that. The next slide, please. The Asia LEDS Partnership, like the other regional partnerships, has uh, come up and has constituted uh, communities of practice. Basically, uh, while we were working with the national governments, there's been an interest to uh, for certain groups within our membership to come together and work uh, in depth on certain topics. So looking at uh, what we heard from the membership and uh, looking at the focus areas, we uh, currently are running uh, five and uh, five communities of practice, four of which are very active. Uh, currently, this webinar is being held as part of uh, the finance communities of uh, community of practice, where our intent is to uh, focus on blended capital and green bonds uh, with an aim to support implementation of NDC targets, with an aim to support implementation of low emission development uh, actions, both at the national and the subnational level. Overall, uh, in our uh, five COPs, we have about 300 participants representing about 20 Asian countries uh, who engage actively within these communities of practice. The next slide, please. Coming to the finance community of practice, uh, currently uh, the community of practice consists of members from about nine countries, uh, 50 plus participants. Uh, last year, uh, in uh, we started in uh, 2018, where uh, we started speaking about green bonds. Uh, and uh, on blended finance, on what they mean, uh, what the tools are. There has been tremendous interest among the membership, and therefore we are doing a series of webinars. We started with an in-person workshop uh, in uh, 2018 December. We had, uh, along with partners, uh, we worked with partners in uh, bringing this uh, knowledge uh, to our membership. So along with UNDP uh, in October this year, there was an in-person boot camp that was uh, held in, uh, India. There was one uh, that was also planned in Southeast Asia and Vietnam, unfortunately, uh, because of international happenings, this, this was something that we could not follow on. And this is something that we will be doing in the future. But uh, this webinar is uh, part of the series of workshops that we are having in order to bring up uh, uh, 
in order to progress the understanding on green bonds, in order to identify uh, countries, governments, subnational entities which may be interested in floating green bonds, and also to deliver in-depth technical assistance to uh, anyone from the membership who may need it to uh, either prepare for floating the green bond or to go through uh, the different uh, steps that are required for floating the green bond. So the membership is able to do that. Uh, it's not it's not that we just host these webinars, but coming out of these webinars, we request members or part of the webinars to get back to us and uh, talk to us about their specific needs. And so uh, we will be addressing them in terms of, uh, with in-depth technical assistance following on. Uh, moving on from the finance community of practice, just to give you an introduction to the other COPs, uh, we also run uh, a clean mobility community of practice focusing on electric mobility, on grid scale renewable energy, and on uh, building energy efficiency. Uh, within the handouts that you have, there are links to register to these communities of practice, and uh, we would encourage you to do so. The next slide, please. We also have a help desk uh, where uh, we are able to provide technical assistance. Uh, we request you to write to the climate help desk and write to the ALP secretariat uh, with your specific technical requests, and we will get back to you uh, on that as well post the webinar. So uh, this is a brief uh, that I wanted to uh, give you on uh, what the ALP is and why this webinar. And uh, we will uh, then move on to the technical presentations. Uh, if uh, may, yeah, I may kindly uh, request uh, Ms. Alexia to give us an introduction to what the green bonds are, uh, the, the taxonomy that we hear, what are the principles and standards, what are the drivers for issuance of green bonds and so on. Uh, may I request Ms. Alexia to uh, kindly speak to us now. Thank you. Thank you, Somia. Can you hear me? Yes, Alexia, I can hear you. Wonderful. Uh, good afternoon, or I guess morning or evening as the case may be. It's evening where I am uh, in the West Coast of the United States. It's lovely to join you, and thanks to the ALP Secretariat for the invitation to speak a little bit about the status of the green bond market and really what the, the fundamentals are. So apologies um, for those of you for whom this is a little remedial, um, but we wanted to make sure that everyone is starting from the same basic framework. And as we've been talking with our member countries and partners um, across the LEDS Global Partnership, what we've really been hearing from folks is that they need some help just getting their arms around this market and really understanding how it works, what the different components are and so we'll walk you through some of those basics now. Uh, next slide please. So I, as Somia mentioned, um, I'm, my name is Alexia Kelly. I co-chair the Low Emissions Development Strategies Global Partnership Finance Working Group and we work with developing countries across a wide range of finance related issues um, with an eye towards really mobilizing finance at scale for nationally determined contribution implementation under the Paris Agreement. And as she noted, the, the work of the LEDS GP is now um, supported by the German government um, and the, the partnership has actually been around for a decade. Um, so we started it in 2010 to provide a place for developing countries to really come together and share experiences. Um, next slide. So what, what exactly are green bonds? I think the most important thing to know about green bonds is that they are debt. And debt, of course, is um, a loan that you take out, um, money that you borrow from either investors or a bank, um, and you agree to pay back oh, at a fixed rate over a set period of time. Um, so they are not grants, uh, you do have to pay them back, um, and they are not free money. They do typically come with uh, some sort of interest rate, and the interest rate depends on a lot of things and factors that we'll talk about in a little more depth uh, shortly. Green bonds are just like regular vanilla bonds, which again are loans that different entities issue, um, but you have to use the proceeds or the revenue that you earn from issuance of that bond for investment in green projects and assets. And we'll talk more about what, what constitutes a green project or asset shortly. It's important to remember that green bonds are really about the underlying projects and assets that are being developed with the green bond revenue um, and not about who issues the green bond. So really anyone can issue a green bond who, you know, people are willing to buy a bond from. <laughs> um, governments, banks, corporations, 
uh, all issue bonds, and we'll we'll talk more about who who's active, most active in the market, and how that's changed over time as well. And at a fundamental level, green bonds are really there to help investors find their way towards the types of things that they want to be investing in, um, which increasingly are low carbon and green infrastructure projects. Uh, next slide. Overall, green bonds are being used as a tool to really help shift our financial markets uh, towards greener investment and towards the low carbon uh, ecosystem transformation. So the global financial markets, the bond market is huge. It represents about $90 trillion. Um, and of that $90 trillion, if we want to meet the Paris Agreement objectives to keep temperature rise below 2 degrees, estimates vary widely, but the International Energy Association estimates that we need about $35 trillion of investment by 2035 in the energy sector alone. And if we look across all sectors that need to be decarbonized, it's about $93 trillion globally by 2030. So there's a huge, there's a lot of cash out there, um, but there's a real need to get it shifted from traditional <laughs> investment pathways, um, which are predominantly fossil fuel based and into low carbon assets and infrastructure. Um, the good news is that because we are in a, what is known as a very low yield environment, which means that interest rates are very low, um, investors are looking for yield. So they're looking for a return on their investment and just leaving it sitting in the bank means that they aren't earning very much on that money because interest rates are so low. And so there's been a huge uptick in interest in instruments like green bonds over the last five years, um, combined with increasing investor pressure and um, interest in really accelerating investment into um, green infrastructure broadly. So both insurers and investors broadly have made significant commitments to really increase the amount of investments they're making in green, in green industries um, and have committed preliminarily to mobilize approximately $60 trillion. Um, however, actually getting those monies moving and scaling up um, is, is certainly a challenge. Next slide. So what, what is in a green bond? When someone says, I issued a green bond, what are they using those proceeds for? Um, this is the green bond taxonomy that's been developed by the Climate Bonds Initiative. And the Climate Bonds Initiative, you'll hear from Sandy in a little bit. Um, but they have really, they're a nonprofit based in London who have done a huge amount of work to help build this market and have really been one of the early leaders in advocating for transparency, certification, and um, industry acceptance of what, what is green. So if I want to issue a green bond, I need to provide assurances that what I am using the money for actually qualifies. So you can see across the top, there's a variety of different sectors that are eligible. So energy, transportation, buildings, uh, and you'll note that those track with the larger, largest sources of global emissions. So you know, heavy industry, cement production, waste, um, and even information and communications technology. Um, but it, they also include important sectors, particularly from a resilience perspective, like water. So um, the state of California and the United States in particular has used bonds extensively to finance a wide variety of water conservation and resilience projects across the state. And that work um, has, has been really, bonds have been really pivotal in the state's ability to address ongoing drought uh, that has certainly been exacerbated by climate change and has been a really important source of revenue to help stimulate investment in key adaptation and resilience measures. So in addition to traditional mitigation projects like you know, clean energy in developing countries, like e-mobility and clean transportation, like more efficient buildings, um, we're also seeing the bond markets begin to play increasingly in, um, in the resilience space. So that is new but um, it is um, definitely advancing and growing and we expect to see significant growth in that particular market in the next few years. Uh, next slide. So there are a number of principles and standards about you know, really what is a bond and what constitutes it. I'm not gonna go into detail on each of these, but there's kind of 
two main global standards or three main global standards. One is the, the Green Bond Principles, which has been issued by the International Capital Markets Association, um, and the, the, green, the Green Bond Principles and the Green Loan Principles. And then the Climate Bonds Taxonomy, including the standard and sector criteria, aligns with the Green Bond Principles and the Green Loan Principles, but also um, allows for third-party verification. And um, that verification is required around the use of proceeds. So what it is that you use the money you raised through your bond issuance for. Um, it also requires important transparency and disclosure um, around what's in your bond and how it's been released. And then we're seeing an increasing number of uh, regional and country specific guidance documents emerging that really address the specific cir circumstances of the capital markets in that in a given country. And I'll, I'll show you a few of those when we go through the roadmap in just a minute. Um, next slide. So you can see Europe has really led um, issuance of, of green bond. Um, the US and North American markets are some of the largest markets and they're uh, growing quickly, but um, Europe has really been leading the charge on green bond issuance for quite some time. Um, and we've seen a real uptick, particularly um, in later years around sovereign issuances. So sovereign governments and subnational governments have really stepped up their issuance activities globally. And we're starting to see increased activity uh, in countries like Africa and Asia Pacific. So the Asia Pacific market grew by 35% in 2018, and we expect to see even stronger year-on-year -year growth uh, in 2019 and 2020. Uh, next slide. You can also see here really who the key players are uh, in the green bond market and how that's changed over time. So if you look in particular at the light blue bar, in 2013, almost 60% of the market was um, covered by DFIs and MDBs. So development finance institutions and multilateral development banks were really leading on the issuance. They really helped, they developed this market in, in the early years and they really helped grow it significantly and build investor confidence in these instruments by issuing significant significant amounts of them. And you can see the big change between 2013 and 2018 in terms of who's issuing the bonds and at what rates. Um, so big growth in financial corporations and non-financial corporations. Um, I believe NG uh, is the largest private corporate green bond issuer in the world. They've issued about $11 billion in green bonds since 2014. Um, and the other thing to note in 2018 is the big uptick in sovereign green bond issuances. So you can see that we're approaching 20% of the global green bond market coming from sovereign issuances. And that uh, similarly, uh, we expect to see strong year on year growth. Next slide. You can also just see here how this change, this uh, market has grown over time. So from about $40 billion in 2014 up to over $260 billion in 2019. And uh, that number is significantly higher than that these days as well. Uh, next slide. So why are sovereigns and subnationals so interested in really growing this market? Um, one, they're interested in you know, doing better strategic coordination between themselves on issuance of, um, of green bonds and climate finance resources for a variety of climate change finance as well as social and economic development reasons. Um, there's also an increasing number of new and diverse investors that are active in the market. And it's definitely one of the things that we've seen in issuances is that um, investors who might not be active in a given country are more willing to invest if the issuance is, a, is, is through a green bond instrument. Um, we are also seeing some pricing advantages, which means that the market tends to view, and there's a heated debate about whether or not this is a real thing, um, but there's, there's some early evidence that indicates that investors see green bonds as a safer investment choice, which means that they're willing to accept a lower interest rate. So if I issue, if I'm issuing a bond, 
people are willing to have me pay less interest on that money because they think that the risk of repayment is lower. Um, and so that has definitely been an important selling point is one of the things that folks have been really interested in exploring and testing out in the market as a whole. Um, we are also, of course, seeing a, a significantly increased interest in mobilizing capital for overall clean energy and, and green infrastructure investment, both to meet international commitments around climate change uh, mitigation through the UN, um, but then also just interest in, in mobilizing additional amounts of, of capital as well, and really positioning countries as an international leader. So Indonesia has emerged as a significant sovereign issuer. Um, go to the next slide, please. And they um, issued one of their first bonds just a couple of years ago, and that has been a big marker, I think, in the market um, and was a significant step forward for the region. Uh, we've also seen a significant uptake of state government issuances. I talked a little bit about California's resilience bond. They also use bonds to fund a wide range of other infrastructure investments. And um, certainly in the U.S. market, bonds are a really common way to raise capital if you're a municipality. Uh, next slide. So we want to do a quick tour of the green bond roadmap, and we're going to see if I can take control of the screen here and navigate over to the roadmap. Can I have control of the screen, please? Can you guys see my screen? Oh, it's trying. Yeah. You can? Yes. Okay, wonderful. So this um, Green Bond Roadmap, it's at globalgreenbondpartnership.org, Green Bond Roadmap, and it's also linked in the presentation document that you have here. Um, and we, we put this together because what we kept hearing from folks was that they really needed a, a guide to just figuring out this market, who the key players were, where things were. So the roadmap does a few things. It provides just a, a basic overview of what is a bond, who's active in the market, what constitutes a green bond, why are people interested in issuing green bonds, um, what are the key project types, and also some curated additional resources that are useful to share with folks if you're trying to help people understand. Um, we also cover a variety of examples around corporate issuances, so folks who have issued um, different types of, of green bonds, and you can see here, if you Google these projects or follow a link, you can get to their underlying green bond framework, which gives you an opportunity to really dig into the details behind what the green bonds actually are and what they look like. Um, we also include a fairly comprehensive list of sovereign green bond issuances and their examples, um, what they were used for, how much they were for, when they were issued, um, who certified them or verified them, uh, and then also include a, a selected set of um, subnational green bond issuances as well. So the purpose of, of these resources are really just to help you actually kind of step through and you can dig in on a variety of case studies as well as um, the assurance reports and the green bond frameworks, which are the, the issuance documents that are developed when you're ready to um, issue a bond and start shopping it around to investors to bring in um, potential financing. And then we also developed a checklist, which enables you to essentially walk through the process of issuing a green bond step by step with a series of key questions that help you identify where your gaps are, um, where additional resources to fill those gaps might be, and provide additional just explanation and background around each step as you go through. So this resource, it's you know obviously publicly available and it's free. Um, so if you're trying to figure out how to get started um, in the green bond market, then um, you can move forward and use this as a resource. The LEDS GP also has some resources available for developing country governments who are interested in road testing this. We have some technical assistance resources available. So please reach out to the secretariat um, who can connect you and we can work to, to help 
countries get ready to, to issue green bonds or cities um, or other subnational entities. So with that, I will wrap it up. Um, thank you very much for your attention and I'll look forward to your questions. Alexia for uh, setting uh, the stage for uh, that very succinct explanation of what the green bonds are and uh, for uh, information on that excellent resource. Uh, we encourage all members to kindly take a look at the resource, uh, see if uh, that's of interest to you. Would you like to test it, part of it, all of it, and uh, get back to the Secretariat and we'll be happy to uh, work with Alexia and team to uh, deliver required technical assistance to you. So. Uh, I see that we do not have uh, any specific questions at this point. We encourage our uh, participants to type in their questions here so we can take them uh, as, as they come in after each presentation. And uh, I think uh, we move on. Uh, we have uh, Mr. Mehul Patwari who will be speaking about uh, why green bonds at all, uh, how do they help, uh, what are those different steps. Uh, Alexia had alluded to them uh, when she was showing the readiness framework but Mehul will lay it out a little bit in detail uh, so you get an overview of what those different steps are and uh, then you can delve into uh, delve into uh, the roadmap uh, subsequently. So uh, if I may request, uh, sorry, I hear there is uh, one question. Anandan, would you uh, read out the question that we have? So Alexia may kindly take it. Sorry, I do not see it in the chat box. Uh, yes, sure. Um, so one question from Mohammed Abdullah is, uh, uh, how about the green bond um, after this COVID? What are the implications? And um, if any um, participants uh, would like to uh, ask questions for themselves, they can raise their hand. There's an icon. You can just try that. Yeah. Over to you, Alexia. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sure the other panelists will have um more informed uh, insight on this question, which is an excellent one. I mean, I think overall, as you know, financial markets are struggling and will continue to struggle. I think investors will be seeking um, investment opportunities that provide some degree of safety. So to the extent that um, green bonds are issued by entities that are viewed as very safe investments, um, you know, green bonds will continue to provide a pathway through there. And I think there's also a broad recognition that just because COVID has happened doesn't mean that we can walk away from our sustainability and um, infrastructure transformation challenges and uh, priorities. And so I expect that um, there will still be continued interest in leveraging these markets to help stimulate investment uh, in economic recovery efforts broadly. Sure. Thank you, Alexia. Maybe others, uh, parties, other speakers can also address it later on. There is one question from uh, Marilyn. Um, uh, Marilyn, you can ask your uh, question. You have been unmuted. Marilyn, are you able to hear us? Okay, maybe he's not able to speak. Uh, sure. There is another question from, I think from Mr. Sunil. I will we'll just unmute him. Uh, yes, Mr. Sunil, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear, uh, hear you. Uh, thanks yes. uh, to you and uh, thanks to the team. Uh, and thanks to Alexia for giving this wonderful presentation on that. So she has uh, covered about the, uh, the definitions and the market and the roadmap for the green bond. Uh, so what I understand that uh, green bonds uh, can be raised for investment into sectors which will lead to the emission reduction. But uh, there are the sectors what uh, has been covered in one of the slides. So this sector will have a different uh, em uh, emission reduction potential for given per unit of a dollar investment. So is there any further grading or ranking for the green bond uh, so that uh, an investor can prioritize that, okay, if I invest $1 in, uh, let's say, solar sector, it will lead to this much of emission. If I invest $1 in a waste sector, it will lead to this much of emission. So based on that emission potential 
per uh, dollar investment or per dollar raised as a debt, is there any further grading? So that's my question. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. Um, and again, I would encourage my fellow panelists to chime in on this. But I do, you know, I do not believe that there is an additional. I think the the emission reductions that occur from a set of um, projects that might be developed under a green bond are estimated typically in the green bond framework, um, but they're not required. Uh, and um, there's not a, a emission reduction per dollar investment metric that is used particularly just given that um, that number is so dependent on the specific circumstances within which your project is being deployed. Um, so, you know, a renewable energy project deployed in a heavily coal fired region um, in India, for example, you know, is gonna have a really different GHG emissions profile than a, a wind farm deployed where I live in Oregon, where we have a lot of hydropower. So the, there's not a standardized emission reduction estimator tool. Um, although I know that South Pole does a lot of work on the offset markets, you guys may have some additional uh, tools that you use to to address some of those more granular questions. Yeah, thank you, Alexia. Mehul, this side, it was a very good question, Vivek. So, uh, from a regulatory perspective, there is there is no requirement uh, to basically spear out that what is the impact as assessment, exact impact assessment. But from the investor perspective, there are very niche investors in the green bond market. So they may be invested in a particular sector. So before issuing a green bond the, and the offer document, you need to specify your environmental objectives and the processes that you would employ to select the, pro the projects. So that has to be very exhaustive. Although in India, uh, there is no requirement for selection of a project through a certified agency, the issuer themselves can decide uh, on the selection of the project on the projects, but they have to mention the process through which they would select. And afterwards, the investment when the project is uh, is on the operational stage, there are various uh, impact assessments that you need to basically present as a part of the annual reporting. Those impact assessment tools, some of the, the companies like Climate Bonds Initiative, like South Pole, they have developed uh, proprietary tools to measure the impacts on every dollar invested sector-wise. So as a part of the reporting, you need to uh, provide that. And depending on the projects, basically you will be able to attract those kinds of investors. So it is more an investor-driven so uh, driven process than a regulatory process. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you Alexia. Uh, uh, there is one please. last question. Maybe we can. Sorry, and I think yes. Sandeep would like yes. to add on to that. Yes. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, as uh, I have a very little to add, but uh, just wanted to state <clears throat> that some issuers voluntarily publish this. So, if you really want to see an example, you can give a search on uh, Yes Bank green bond impact report they have actually quantified how much of carbon saving has occurred uh, and as alexia said it's uh, not always very easy and if you add on to that the embedded emissions so if you pick up four or five kinds of solar panels the embedded emissions in four to five of them can be quite different the embedded emissions means the emissions which have been gone into making those solar panels and then transporting them. Uh, so that adds uh, certain other layers of complexity. I'm very happy to see that South Pole and other organizations have uh, evaluated, uh, have made tools to uh, do that, but that's not a requirement. However, some organizations do it. And for an example, you can go to Yes Bank uh, Impact Report. It's uh, freely available over the net. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes. Uh, thank you. There is one question from uh, Mr. Pat uh, Patrick. Uh, would you like to speak? Mr. Patrick? Uh, yeah. Hello. Hello. I, I just wondered, can you can hear me? Yes. Yes. Please go on. Uh, I just wanted to ask. There was a slide on bond taxonomy. Uh, so some of some of the different taxonomy uh, structures have been classified as developed and underdeveloped, uh, underdeveloped or under development. 
However, there are some sectors like nuclear and aviation which have not been classified as such. So, what exactly is their status? It is uh, already developed. What is their status? I just want to know. Thank you. Sandeep, do you want to take that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, uh, how we have come to the taxonomy is by collating a lot of work from a lot of scientific organizations. Uh, and taken a lot of stakeholder feedback in compiling that. So nuclear typically we have not included because there is a principle called do no significant harm. Now, as you might know, decommissioning nuclear power plants uh, can be very troublesome. So therefore, as of now, it is not there. Uh, if technologies can come which make that uh, a not so pro pro problematic issue, uh, then you know we can uh, certainly include that so this has come with a lot of consultations and why certain things are not there you know has detailed explanations of all of them so we can't this the scope of this webinar can't be into all that uh, what i would suggest is there is uh, a pri five minute video by nathan fabian pri's principles for Restor on eu taxonomy it's a five minute video on PRI website by Nathan Fabian, uh, where he gives an overview of how uh, the EU taxonomy, which is very similar to our taxonomy, uh, has come across. That will give you the underlying principles of why certain things are in and why how things people have gone about including and excluding things. And for each sector, it's it's extremely detailed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks very much. Okay, thanks a lot. Thank you very much for the questions. Uh, I think we move along and uh, we take uh, questions subsequently uh, after uh, Mr. Mehul Patwari's uh, presentation. Mehul, may I kindly request you to go ahead, please? Yeah, thank you, Samia. <laughs> good morning and good evening, depending on the geographies where the attendees are. Uh, thank you, Asia Let's Partnership, for this wonderful opportunity. Uh, in, in my presentation, I would cover basically. Uh, the four topics. Uh, one is the green bonds for developing and uh, implementing low carbon sustainable infrastructure investments. The steps that the, the municipalities or the urban local bodies basically need to look into for developing uh, uh, infrastructure projects. The regulatory disclosure requirements. As Alexa tell that green bonds basically is a debt. It is uh, the regulatory requirements for issuance of a bond is, is exactly similar for those of a green bonds. But there are further regulatory disclosure requirements. So I will cover them from an Indian perspective and the benefits to the various stakeholders. <clears throat> so first, why, why uh, various corporations, governments? Uh, backslide, please. Backslide. Yeah, why various corporations, governments consider green bond as a financing tool? So one of the most important reasons that it, it uh, green bonds are very niche investors. So it provides basically a large pool of low cost capital to finance low carbon and sustainable projects. Green bonds basically are considered to be uh, to, uh, to be a good infrastructure opportunity. The emissions they basically uh, emit are considered less than a normal infrastructure developments. Hence are considered to be uh, more climate sensitive and safe investments. More research has been done on projects, so basically it offers a low cost capital for the green project development. The investors for these projects are very niche, so you diversify the sources of funding and expand the investor base. Not only green funds and bonds help you to finance the projects, it also gives you national and international visibility of the projects. So some of the subnational governments are interested basically just to basically have more visibility on the projects. Right, so these are fundamentally the reasons for issuing green bonds as a financing tool. Next slide, please. Next slide, please. Yeah, so basically, how would the cities access the green bond market flows? So I have prepared basically a simple flow chart. So can the city issue a green bond? One of the fundamental requirements of a green bond is that the issuer should have an investment grade credit rating. If the issuer has got the credit rating in effect, has got the pipeline of the projects, it can go ahead and issue the green bonds. If, if the municipality does not have a credit worthy investment rating, 
then what we look is that there can be various special purpose vehicles which are developing projects which are owned by the municipality can basically the revenues from the special purpose vehicles be escrowed and that entity can have an investment grade credit rating so the answer is yes it can still go and issue the green bond if the municipality does not have this option then there are various credit enhancement mechanisms so various development finance institutions work with the municipalities provide guarantees and these guarantees basically can enhance the credit worthiness and then the green bonds can be issued so that is also not the case municipalities can borrow from various banks financing institutions so these institutions can basically raise the bonds and then finance the projects with the municipality or the uh, government is developing in that way the projects would get visibility if that is also not the case then you can look for various public private partnership options where the private operator can issue the green bond for financing the projects so basically this is this is a flow where you can know that in case <coughs> the issuer is unable to you uh, issue the green bond still the projects can be financed through green bonds through various structures next slide please now what are the various steps the city needs to take to issue a green bond one of the fundamental step is design so you basically design uh, uh, the various steps for the project selections which of the project selection you would do which the project classifies as the green bond under the various regulation what is the business case of a project how it is going to repay the interest and the principal that would decide on the type of the bond the regulatory fit and then you identify various partners like your merchant bankers credit rating agencies green certification agencies banks so on so forth the next step is rating and certification you basically <coughs> the issuer needs to <coughs> do a rating of itself and then the project it needs to basically fund through the use of proceeds then they need to have a, a certification it can be self certification or you can hire an agency who can <coughs> who can do the certification normally various type of investors are more comfortable if it is done by an independent agency credit worthy agency once you have all the <coughs> ecosystem partners in place with the help of the merchant bankers you prepare the offer document you list the projects the key project agreements what are the monitoring and verification structure uh, what are the issuance structures type of bond and once the offer document is ready the key part is basically marketing of the of the bond so merchant bankers basically do road shows and one to one meeting with anchor investors so that you explain the benefits of the projects and uh, the benefits of the issue and the most important thing in a green bond is basically monitoring and reporting as we saw the uh, the question of one of the participants that once the project is implemented through the process there are various reporting requirements so quantitative and qualitative environment impacts during operations so this is one of the most important aspects when you actually issue a green bond next slide please so what are the various types of green bonds so i will briefly cover there are four types of green bonds depending on the projects and and the type of the risks that the issuer or the investor basically bears one is the use of proceeds bond we are basically the proceeds uh, uh, allocated <coughs> the issuer basically out of the proceeds allocates to various sub portfolio of the green projects here the issuer only sets the internal processes to track the usage of funds and reporting to the investors since it is the issuer who decides it there is a complete recourse to the issuer uh, the bond holders or the investors don't have recourse to the project revenues then there are revenue bonds we are the revenues of the selected projects are ring fenced for the bond payments interest and principal so in this case the bond holders do have recourse to the project cash flows there are also the issuer sends the internal uh, processes then there are securitized bonds so for some kind of project securitized bonds have been uh, have been a uh, very good offerings uh, the investors have lapped it up so here the, the basically the assets are collateralized uh, by one or the more projects uh, the interest repayment is generally from the cash cash flow of this asset so for various type of projects like rooftop solar plants or energy efficiency projects basically the fundamental of this projects is that before this project is implemented the uh, the the development company or the issuer basically is spending a certain amount of money uh, for uh, for for usage of those for in, in the case of solar uh, rooftop pv you pay a particular price 
to a distribution company for a per unit of electricity. Under the rooftop solar, the, pr the price would be less. It, it is basically the amortization of the asset, the interest and the principal repayments and the operations of the solar rooftop. So then, then there's a savings. This savings basically uh, is carved out uh, into a sinking fund, which is then used to repay the bonds. Hence, basically the asset is securitized and so the securitized bonds. And there are other bonds like the project bonds. Normally bonds are used as a refinancing tool, but in some of the cases, they are also used to finance projects. So the proceeds of bonds are used in financing single multiple projects as per the offer document. Then the investors have a direct exposure on the risk of the projects. Unlike other cases, basically in the use of proceed bonds, the investors have exposure to the issuer. Here there's exposure to the risk of the projects. Depending on the credit worthiness of the issuer, it can be with or without recourse to the investor, depending on, on the structure. Next slide, please. Yeah, next slide. So uh, uh, from a green bonds perspective, I'll, I'll consider the Indian regulations. There are certain regulatory re requirements by the Securities and Exchange Board of India. So the proceeds of the bond issue, if you're issuing green bond, can go to a specific projects. So the SEBI has determined what are the eligible projects. So it's, it's basically in the energy sector, renewable energy or other clean sources of energy, clean transportation, sustainable water management, climate change adaptation, energy efficiency projects, sustainable waste management, land use and uh, other projects and biodiversity conservation. So these are the basically list of projects under which investments can basically go after the issuance of the green bonds. Next slide, please. The other requirement, specific requirements are disclosure. So you need to mention the environmental objectives of the issue. This is very important. Once you mention the environmental objectives in the offer document, basically you need to invest in the projects which has those environment, which, which serves those environmental objectives. And then you need to mention the decision-making process, how, how you would uh, shortlist the project, what goes in uh, basically that process, the systems and procedures that are to be employed, and how basically the, the money is basically invested in these projects. The external review and the, and the certification requirements. So in India, there is no mandatory requirements to get uh, an external uh, certification, but it, as I said earlier, it depends on the type of investors you are targeting. There are specific niche investors who may be more comfortable if you get the project certified through an independent agency. So it is all depending on, on what, is, what are your target investors. Next slide, please. So then there are reporting requirements. So there are half yearly requirements as well as there are annual reporting. In the half yearly requ requirements, basically you need to mention uh, how you have invested the proceeds physically. And, th and those mentioned has to be through a verified by an external auditor. And you also need to mention what are the unutilized proceeds and where they are basically uh, kept. Annual reporting includes basically the investment into the projects, details of the projects, so, <clears throat> depending on the so cost confidentiality agreements, as you had mentioned in the offer document. And once you have invested in the project and the project is operational, what are the performance indicators, quantitative as qualitative? So what was the assumptions during the feasibility stage, what you had mentioned in the offer document, and what is basically the output-based uh, parameters? And what are the methods, basically, the assumptions that you have used, whether it is, uh, what are the impact reporting standards, whether it is self-reporting or it, you, are, you are doing it to a third-party agency? So what are the various indicators, metrics, all basically needs to be reported in the annual report, which goes to the bondholders. So this reporting, how you report would be a would be a function of what you have stated in your offer document and the responsibility of the issue it, it basically they have to maintain the decision making processes mention it up front and stick to those decision making processes to determine the eligibility of the projects you you need to ensure that all the project basically money is invested into the projects which which is green and then utilize the uh, proceeds only for the stated purposes so these are in in general the regulatory requirements as, as determined by the Securities and Exchange Board of India. Next slide, please. So as you can see, the issuance of the green bonds is, is similar to that of a normal vanilla bond. 
but the key thing there are there are two key things which which basically a municipality needs to look into one is basically identification of the projects right so there has to be a strategy on how you will identify the project because it needs to be the green project and you also need to report the benefit it, it creates to the environment when you are investing in a project through the proceeds of the green bonds and the second important thing is, is basically once you, once you you have the bond issued what are the reporting and monitoring uh, requirements so these are the two, two two main things that you need to basically follow up so uh, in our opinion a lot of capacity building is required especially in the indian municipalities on introduction of the green bonds how to access uh, the financial flows the mapping of the projects the monitoring requirements and finally the green bond assessment frame so this is basically new some of the municipalities have have issued uh, uh, bonds uh, very few have of them have issued green bonds but there is a lot of pipeline of the projects uh, especially in the in the renewable energy in the electric mobility sector that can be financed using green bonds so this is basically assessing what is required to be done from a municipal level to enhance so that the participation of green bond increases in financing low carbon sustainable projects next slide please so why are we talking of green bonds what are the benefits to the various stakeholders right so basically uh, what we have done is we have identified four stakeholders and we have tried to state the ben uh, benefits one is the banks so uh, as you know that banks basically rely on the casa deposits right so the there is the, the capital is not long term bonds essentially are a refinancing tool so it helps release the capital to the banks for the new financing and helps correct the asset liability mismatch from the issuer perspective basically it it helps them to raise a fixed term debt low, low cost fixed term debt so which can enhance the equity returns and most importantly because of green bonds it diversifies the investor base you can get niche investors and, and your projects basically get their international national visibility so this is a huge plus so the investors basically certain investors are having <coughs> basically when they raise money from their investors also they have a rule to invest in green projects so basically there's a huge uh, requirements for them for, for searching of the projects right the money is there you need to identify the projects so there is a definite interest of certain niche investors to invest in the green projects and green projects are considered to be the safe right so there there is a potential appreciation of the green bond so basically the price would fall and the yield would increase so, so it, it's considered to be a potential appreciating asset and for the government basically it opens up one more avenue of capital raising for the green projects and as as in the previous uh, presentation you had seen that what is total quantum of financing required maybe the total quantum is more than an us 1 trillion per year so so that it opens the one more market avenues and it develops the market so that basically it, it becomes a virtuous cycle of growth so from a government is it's a win win to develop the bond to be the green bond market thank you Uh, I would be happy to take questions. Um, I think we have the participants uh, trying to understand uh, the various steps that you have put forth and uh, the uh, different benefits and uh, what are the different drivers, etc. Uh, we have uh, one question, uh, but I think this is more to uh, Alexia as the co-chair of the finance working group. Uh, Alexia, there's a question from uh, Mr. Suryanto Ibrahim. Uh, basically, uh, he indicates that most cities, especially in Indonesia, have difficulty in making proposals that are accepted internationally. The feasibility that is uh, study that is done is considered incomplete, and therefore we would require technical assistance uh, to make good proposals. Is this something that you can help them with? So, Alexia, any response to this one? Yeah, thanks. I, this is certainly a challenge that we see often um, is that the folks who are, and this is not, by the way, just in Indonesia, this is also in um, developed countries as well. You know, often the people who are tasked with implementing the sustainability objectives or the climate action plan um, are not well versed in financial 
terms. And so it's very difficult for them to evaluate the business case for a specific set of investment opportunities or projects um, in a way that that is compelling to the private sector um, or even to international donors. And so that is definitely a key area of capacity building that we focus on as the, the LEDS GP. And um, Somia, you know, defer to you guys in terms of next steps, but I know that UNDP, um, as as well as the LEDS GP, both have technical assistance resources available for subnational entities um, who are interested in enhancing their capacity to issue um, and develop feasibility studies for specific low carbon infrastructure projects. So feel free to reach out to the, the ALP Secretariat and we can see if we can get you connected up with, with resources there. Somia, anything to add on that front? Yes, Alexia, thank you for that. Uh, yes, I just reiterate what you said. Uh, so just, just so our uh, participants and our members know, uh, the technical assistance that the uh, the ALP is, uh, if if you would like, is like a curator of uh, of uh, technical uh, assistance and expertise. So uh, depending upon what the specific need is, we are able to reach out to a large group of experts and a large uh, pool of technical assistance available with uh, member. Um, partner agencies and partner institutions, like you said, uh, Alexia, UNDP, if it's anything to do with the bonds, maybe South Pole CBI. So we would reach out uh, on your behalf and we would ensure that uh, the relevant technical assistance is delivered. So yeah, we encourage you to get back to us and uh, with any specific questions, or even if you think uh, a generic uh, training program on uh, finance structuring on good principles, any of this would be useful. Uh, a, any any requests on capacity building, all of this could be sent our way and uh, we will be sure to help you with that. Thank you. If um, there are no additional questions at this point, uh, I think we move on to uh, the presentation uh, from Mr. Sandeep Bhattacharya, the India Project Manager from CBI. Uh, Sandeep would be speaking to us about uh, very specific cases, projects amenable to green bonds, uh, uh, issuance, uh, bond guarantees, etc. So uh, over to you, Sandeep. Thanks, Somya. Uh, the next slide, please. Yeah, and this is just for the visual, uh, you know, uh, the, I'll speak for long and I'll speak on details, which is a bit boring. Uh, so they will be interfaced with some uh, videos and hopefully that breaks the monotony. So the first class of assets which I would like to speak upon is energy efficient street lamps. Uh, those in India must have heard of a company called the Energy Efficiency Services Limited, EESL, which is a success and EESL has been asked to replicate its model in Malaysia and Saudi Arabia. What it does is it goes to the cities replaces the existing lamps which in large cases were sodium vapor lamps with leds and because it procures in bulk it has been able to take off the marketing costs associated with leds and from around 350 rupees today the same led costs around eight rupees that's i think a 20 times reduction in costs so the slide here represents, you know, that an incandescent lamp 22 are equal to three CFLs and three CFLs is equivalent to around one LED. And I think with efficiencies that has improved, this is a bit outdated. So a project is basically about replacing existing street lamps with the LEDs in the understanding that the electricity saved, the cost on electricity saved. Next slide, please. Yeah, so here is the graph of you know what used to happen before the implementation. You can see on the left hand side, and then the energy use goes down. As you see on the period of construction, it keeps on going down. And then post implementation, it is to a new lower level. The next slide, please. Yeah, and therefore energy bills have come down. And therefore the way most of it works is that, the next slide, please. 
that yes, there is a ESCP or ESCO, what is called, which comes in between and tells the municipality, look, I will replace all your bulbs. You don't need to do anything. You just pay us a certain portion of the uh, savings. That is called the ESCO model. Yeah, the next slide, please. Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry, the previous one. I'm very sorry. Sorry, the previous one. So uh, while this is the current model, there is no reason why a municipality cannot issue a bond and deploy those proceeds to buy the lamps and uh, hire the ESCO to actually just, just do the changing. So that is definitely something which can be done, uh, but somehow uh, municipalities don't seem to have caught on to it themselves till now. Yeah, the next slide, please. So the other very portable asset, a uh, very common asset is of uh, water treatment. So the Climate Bonds Initiative has included water treatment in its taxonomy and also has, uh, has uh, made standards on it. And generally the water is, these water infrastructures, whether it's wastewater or whether it's the uh, portable water, the infrastructure which refines them uh, is operated by the municipalities and in certain case by in the city of say Jamshedpur or now in Nagpur uh, by private sector entities. And in certain cases, there are specialized businesses like Bharat Jal Limited who supply water to construction workers in large cities. Those are private sector and they, those water is supplied through electric vehicles. So uh, again, municipalities have a huge scope of issuing bonds. There are other private players as well who can be in this fray. The next slide, please. So this slide explains, it gives a high level overview of the water standard. So please note in water, there is a combination of mitigation as well as adaptation, which means it doesn't work if you just make the water, the availability of water very low carbon, which means very little energy is used, but it is done in such a manner that the water table dries up. That doesn't work. So a water table drying up would mean that when there is a drought, there is a severe acute shortage of water. So it needs to combine mitigation and adaptation, which can be a bit complex, but uh, as the next slide shows, next slide please. Yeah, we have been able to make it into a checklist so that you know the bond issuance is uh, enabled. So nearly any municipality would have these kind of assets and they can enable the issuance. Uh, and But as of now, what is happening is a lot of other projects also on water treatment are coming up as the further slide slows, shows. Yeah, the next slide, please. Uh, please, I've kept this a bit India-centric. And as we know that one of the longest rivers in the world, uh, sorry, not the longest rivers, but, uh, but which supports a lot of population is the Ganges and which has been very dirty and after a lot of planning and failures a lot of projects are in execution on the on the ganges and this uh, puts some of them i believe most of them will be eligible for uh, issuing bonds by means of green bonds the next slide please and uh, these are also some large projects a lot of them uh, prompted uh, by strict regulation about industrial effluence. Somehow industrial effluence, there has been regulations, but they haven't been followed that well, but uh, authorities have become strict now and you can see a lot of them coming out on this. So yes, the next slide, please. Yeah, so now we look at urban transportation and largely it's Metro Railways. This is slide is again an, yeah, except from our uh, standards. So basically it means Metro railways nearly always work. Railways, it's the orange shows that sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work. A uh, public bike, bike means uh, uh, bicycle uh, train all, uh, track always work, but Metro railways nearly always work. Yeah, so next we'll take some uh, instances. Next slide, please, yeah. So here are some instances of Metro railways. Most of the ones are, uh, are a combination, you know, they are managed by entities which are a joint venture between the state government and the central government. Most of the metros, especially the on the top of the listed on top of 
the uh, table are that way. Uh, again, the context here is very India specific, so this might not apply to all the countries. Apologies to the people from various other countries. Uh, there are a government of India enterprise, which is the one in the eastern city of Kolkata. And there are also some public private partnerships, which means basically the there is a concession based on which a private <coughs> company has come and constructed a metro, which we can see in the city of Mumbai. And the LNT Hyderabad Metro is supposed to be one of the longest private uh, metro ever uh, till now. And I believe it is also coming up in the city of Pune, the, in, in, in the state of Maharashtra, a, a private link. Uh, and uh, so this, these are some of the types. They are urban utility functions, but various kind of organizations render them. So it can, the organization issuing can be a bit different. Yeah, next slide, please. And here we are. This is looking into bus services. Bus services are increasingly becoming either hydrogen driven or EV. Uh, and here also we have that in certain cities, the bus services are managed by a division of the municipality. The Bombay Electricity and State Transport, <coughs> BEST, uh, is, is a division of the Brihan Mumbai Municipal Corporation. But in many cities, it is the transportation is managed by a subsidiary of the state government or a special uh, state government department in certain cases. So these can be the issuers and the projects they're likely to be are say trams as can be seen here, hopefully not the old ones which run on electricity <coughs> or electricity buses, or as we will go along and see the increasing charging infrastructure which is getting set up Next slide, please. Yeah, so here we are. There are fast charging our battery swapping stations. Uh, now the jury is not exactly out on which will be the main uh, <coughs> winner in the long run. But here you can see in the city of Tirupati, the municipal corporation uh, collaborated with a battery manufacturer called Amara Raja Batteries for a charging station. And uh, we will see in a video just after this that there is a business in Hyderabad, uh, an OEM called uh, Original Equipment Manufacturer called Gaiam Motor Auto, uh, which has collaborated with retailers like IKEA, uh, Amazon, Flipkart, uh, and others in providing them the vehicles which uh, can be swapped. And the swapping stations are set up, battery swapping stations are set up. Uh, at the premises of the retailers currently, but then nobody says that it has to be the case as things are going along. Uh, so I believe, let's put on the video. The volume might be a bit low. I will do a voiceover. Yeah, okay, sorry. So this one more thing, the this uh, upgrades to the grids for the charging station. So basically you put on a charging station. It also needs means that the grid which is supplying to the charging station needs to be upgraded. Even this expenditure can be uh, incurred by by means of a green bond. And here is some examples. Sometimes oil majors and electricity majors are putting up these charging stations or uh, sometimes the, it is the electrical utility which is putting these putting the uh, importance upgrades. So there are various kind of issuers for the same urban utility functions. And it is up to a particular municipality to see what part of the activity they want to get into. There are plenty of engineers, I believe, on this, and they will have ideas about where they can and where they cannot do and what kind of JVs they can or cannot get into. So I think the next uh, will be a video which illustrates the case of Gaiam Auto, which is operating in Hyderabad on a certain model. I'm not saying that that has to be the model which goes ahead, but this is taking a bit of an example. Yes. So the voice is a bit low, unfortunately. So this is a manufacturer which is actually exporting uh, to many countries, including those in Europe. Uh, so again, with some apologies to non-Indians, it gives us a little bit of reason to feel slightly uh, proud about. And the design is such that it actually matches the conventional vehicles which are driven. Uh, so it can climb up the slopes, which are sometimes necessary to 
deliver which has been issues with there have been issues about these kind of issues with imported uh, e-vehicles the BEST had to uh, resign some imported vehicles imported buses because they couldn't climb up stops so this is uh, proven to be uh, tough in that respect this is a bit of a shot of the factory there uh, and now we'll slowly come uh, to the question of charging so what this OEM feels is a charging station might not be the best business model and uh, in this particular case since there is there is a space available with Amazon Flipkart and IKEA the swapping station can be built in their premises as well uh, I'm sure there will be instances when you know uh, municipalities will see the ability to use some of their space uh, and uh, to do the swapping stations in this case the company has also developed some swapping uh, which is their own patented some swapping methodology and we will soon get a slight overview about how this whole thing works in an illustrated uh, by an illustration by a drawn illustration yes here you go so here you have a trolley which just takes it out and here is it it puts it in this is just a swapping station and here you go ready to go back on the road and at the swapping station what happens is that it is recharged the batteries are recharged when they're ready again these vehicles come they reload and they go So these are some of the technical details as to why uh, about the design of the swapping and the design of the vehicle and some of the map of Hyderabad where it is all there and some of it how much it can load and so these opportunities can be with you know the aggregated cab providers like Uber as well and uh, slowly even to the auto drivers you know the tuk-tuks what is called tuk-tuks Okay, so here we are. Uh, so, are there a few questions, or uh, should I go ahead? With this. There are a few questions, Sandeep. Would you like to take them at this point? Uh, okay, because I think the solid waste has uh, is likely to generate more, so I would want to answer this right now. Uh, health of ULVs is not in good shape and many ULVs do not well like accounting processes. Yes, this is an issue <clears throat> There is a in India. There is I don't know from where this question is if I'm assuming it's India centric the yes, there is a national accounting manual which uh, I know that the DFID has made some efforts and uh, There is a not-for-profit in Bangalore uh, Srikant Vishwanathan heads it uh, who is who's making it uh, making a lot of, of efforts in uh, uh, getting many municipalities up the curve yes there are capacity issues uh, the long term solution i think is that a lot of accounting needs to be outsourced uh, it will take uh, uh, some time for many municipalities to get up the curve uh, we will see one case of indoor which is well up the curve and has come up with a plan with a fairly uh, engineeringly advanced plan to come up with how to do it so i think uh, my friend Srikant would be in a better position to answer about how to get the accounting transition done but i think the summary of discussion of me with him is that it necessarily needs to be outsourced and if say 40 municipalities come together and decide to outsource then it becomes a viable business the list of activity doesn't seem to cover a large taxonomy sustainable transport okay the 
the uh, SEBI guidelines. Yeah. Sandeep, yeah. sorry, uh, could I just read out the question so that the rest yeah. of the participants know what we are answering because oh, sure, they sure. cannot see the questions. Okay, sure. sure. So uh, this is a question from Mr. Vishwas. Uh, the list of activities by SEBI. Uh, the Securities and Exchange Board uh, of India doesn't seem to cover a large taxonomy. For example, sustainable transport is not on the list. So if somebody wants to create a green bond for this sector, what are the regulatory requirements? This is a question from Mr. Vishwas. Over to you, Sandeep. Yeah, so uh, I, I, I don't remember the exact list, but the SEBI uh, uh, taxonomy so is actually a condensed version of ours. So, uh, sorry, Bihal, were you saying something? Yeah, Sandeep. So, Vishwas, uh, I think you missed out the, the second uh, list of project in the SEBI is sustainable transport. Basically, it, it treats clean transportation, including mass public transportation. So, it, it would include e-mobility, clean transportation, is sustainable transportation. So, very much transport sector is included in the in the the SEBI taxonomy and the eligible list of projects plus if you look at the SEBI circular it also says any other projects approved by the board so some of the project is not included and it is indeed green you can go back to SEBI and it can be included but sustainable transport is very much included thank you thank yes, you Sandeep, please go yeah, ahead uh, there are some next questions. Actually, uh, Mehul, you answered uh, it very well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think sure. we can uh -huh. unmute the uh, participants, so I think uh, we can ask the question. He has raised his hand, Mr. Arshad. Uh, Mr. Arshad, uh, we see that you have uh, self-muted. Uh, kindly unmute, then you will be able to speak. Uh, definitely. Thank you very much for the opportunity. And uh, this question uh, would have probably been directed more at uh, Mr. Mikul. Um, it was connected to the secure uh, green bonds, secured green bonds that uh, he had uh, mentioned. So uh, when uh, Alexa uh, mentioned about uh, the uh, global green bond uh, framework uh, website, I think it was global green bond um let me quickly pull it out global green bonds partnership partnership dot uh, thank you for that so there are blurbs uh, which talk about uh, different companies i recently came across an example of a scandinavian uh telecom company which talks about uh, a 50 50 equity and uh, debt based uh, hybrid or green hybrid bond and it talks about four categories that is energy efficiency, green digital solutions, renewable energy, and green buildings. And it essentially talks about new or greenfield projects and also uh, existing projects that are no older than two years. So would it also mean that uh, uh, the green bonds essentially gives you an opportunity to, uh, for uh, let's say IPPs to exit uh, fairly new projects and that also could be a part of the portfolio or it essentially only has to be uh, year-mark projects, projects that are envisaged and could potentially come up in the future. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, so green, basically green bonds is more about the projects. So it can, okay. it can be greenfield project, it can be brownfield project. So it can also be basically a project is operational and it is basically takeout financing. So you are refinancing the bank loan to a green bond. So okay. the underlying pro project has to be green. It doesn't matter whether it's a new project or a brownfield project. Okay. And would uh, what they've classified as a 50-50 equity and uh, dead bond qualify uh, as a secured bond that you had uh, uh, especially uh, uh, you know, pointed out? So then I will have to have more details. I said securitized okay. bond. Se se securitized. securitized bond. Yeah, so basically, the, uh, for example, Sandeep was giving an example of uh, energy efficiency lamps, right? So right. before the project is implemented, in such projects, securitized bonds works very well because you exactly know what are the cash outflows, for example, in the normal lighting. And when okay. you basically implement a LED lighting project, there is a defined savings. 
So that say out of that savings, basically uh, there are three components. One is the asset amortization. So basically, what you invest in purchase of LED, you amortize over a period of during the life of that asset, maybe eight years, ten years. Then the interest and the the interest repayment. And third is any operational expenses. Uh, in the LED case, there would be no operational expenses, but for solar rooftop, there may be some operational expenses. So the savings over and above that basically generally is used as a sinking fund to repay the, the debt. So that asset is securitized with the cash flows from the project. So that is how the securitized bond is, is all about. I understand. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have a final question. Hello, sorry, Hello. I think we lost you. Uh, yes, hi, um, Anandan here. That is one last question. Uh, is low income housing projects are covered for green bonds? And uh, National Housing Bank in India is the regulatory body for such projects. This is the question raised by Rohit Singh. Do you have? Yes. Yeah. yeah I, uh, maybe later I will take this. So yes, the low, if the low income housing has a green building component to it, definitely it can be covered in the green bond because energy energy efficiency building green building is covered under the green bond. But that that building component has to be green. That that is the requirement. Thank you. Oh, Sandeep, you may want to add. Yes, yes. So uh, uh, this has been a journey for us. We have been trying to implement <clears throat> uh, and encourage uh, green housing, which hasn't been very encouraging, to be very honest. In the commercial sector, there are lots of green buildings. But in the housing sector, we have been struggling a bit. However, there is good news. The the IIFL Housing Finance is a company which has taken this load up onto themselves, and they have been holding events uh, called Kutum in various cities where they train developers on constructing green housing. And I'm very happy to say that they are on the last leg of issuing a 50 million US dollar green bond, and uh, they have painstakingly set up a unit within a 10 member unit within the company which will monitor and help the developers in keeping the building up to the green specifications there have been earlier some bad experience on this where developers have said oh this is too stringent i can't do it but the good news is iifl home finance has worked on this assiduously over the past two years and has built up the expertise and you will soon see one uh, but not from NHPA. Yes, National Housing Bank is the regulator. Thanks. Sure. Thank you so much. Maybe we can continue with the uh, next yeah. slides. Yeah. So the other uh, factor, other industry, which is increasingly coming up, and I'm increasingly getting lots of inquiries from uh, tenders, which have been floated by various cities, is about green waste management. and in waste management, we need to distinguish between solid and uh, not liquid, uh, green solid waste management. Within solid, we need to distinguish between dry and wet. So what is dry? Dry could be you know, the plastic wrappers, the paper packages which come, the thermocall which comes to your house and you throw it away. Sometimes large, large things like even say televisions or tables and chairs which you throw away, those are uh, those are the dry those are the dry and the wet are essentially the vegetable peels or sometimes fruits which have gone waste or sometimes you know the cooking waste which happens in restaurants these are the wet wet ones the wet waste can be and is being used to generate electricity and compost and uh, i'm happy to let you know that within this there are macro and micro plants like if you go to the most uh, posh area of mumbai which is pali hills in bandra uh, there's a municipal park uh, with a water reservoir which is given an area to uh, process the uh, 
wet waste of the nearby restaurants and buildings this drives a street which is street lamps which for around two and a half kilometers and also produces compost for the municipal garden and in the city of nashik in india uh, in cent in maharashtra the centralized waste processing plants produces good quality compost which is then sold to farmers by rcf a nationalized uh, fertilizer company into <coughs> various farmers in the ahmednagar area which is the onion belt so this is already functioning uh, we haven't seen a bond issuance from it yet it hasn't reached that scale but i know this is functioning and growing and even as we speak i know of a company which is going out and reaching out to housing societies and saying hey give us uh, an area which is around two two parking lots two car parking lots and we will ensure that the electricity bill of your common area is reduced by say 80% because you know that is just like net metering and on top of that we will give you give the housing society whatever revenue is uh, coming from selling of compost proportion to you uh, and in return all you have to do is segregate the wet waste in the house and supply it to us and don't just dump it in you know in the municipality that is also very green because it avoids the transportation of the green wet waste so this is a very encouraging trend uh, and i believe uh, this is coming up in a lot of spaces and municipalities are now giving tenders that this needs to be done and the decentralized one is especially very encouraging uh, another business model is of uh, let's recycle or nepra resource management uh, which i think we have a video on it next about how about how it works and i think sandeep patel the ceo is also listening into this uh, ceo of nepra is also listening into this uh, webinar so without much ado i would request you to please please play the video on nepra let's recycle volume please Hi, the sound is not being heard. Uh, I think we have uh, trouble with the okay, okay, uh, okay. speaker. Okay, so uh, this is uh, the CEO of uh, Nepra, who's incidentally also listening in, who with his team has set up a fairly innovative uh, operation in Ahmedabad. which uh, sandeep uh, excuse me if i am misrepresenting hopefully i am not you have given me enough brief about your operations for me not to misrepresent uh, is that they go to various institutions schools and collect uh, the dry waste and then separate it into the right components and then put it back into the value chain for creating various products now this seems very simple as i stated but it is not so this uh this is how the whole thing works and the very humane part of this operation is that a lot of rag pickers have been given a decent income uh because of this where they have ensured that the rag pickers uh get a fair amount for what they pay and in terms of the sustainable development goals it has uh, been quite a pioneer uh, to achieve now it is ramping up operations and is setting up operations in indore and pune as well where i think in indore there is a uh, jv with the indore municipal corporation uh, in ahmedabad it is stand alone there is no uh, link with the corporation as well so this is a, a pioneering uh, example of a company which uh, is actually earning profits and is profitable uh, from waste management literally making gold 
at the bottom of the pyramid. So as you can see, the latest controls applied to a sector which we all consider is completely disorganized. And this is their plant, and this is the conveyor belt which uh, helps in separating uh, paper from plastic and various kinds of plastics from each other, which are then again recycled into the uh, value chain. And yes, these are some of the board meetings and the sophisticated machinery which is used. So this is, I think, a classic example of uh, an impact company which has uh, become very close to being mainstream uh, company and hopefully soon becomes a fairly large cap company. And how a circular economy can actually be profitable. I promise you the video with the sound was very entertaining. Uh, and I regret the loss of entertainment value of the sound. Thank you, Sandeep. I think uh, we move on uh, to the presentation. We have within the handout uh, the links to the uh, video, which is online, yes. and we would yeah. encourage participants to kindly take a look at the video. Uh, we played yeah. this just before the webinar. Everything worked well. It doesn't. I guess that's uh, that's the way technology is, unfortunately. Yes. Okay. Uh, but yeah, we no continue problem. with our presentation. Thank you. Sure, sure. absolutely. Okay. <clears throat> so now we have been largely dealing with urban functions, uh, but the assets which can go into green bonds, which are utility assets, need not be only urban. So watersheds is basically essentially a rural asset. I mean, there might be a city which has a watershed. I'm not denying that. But in 99% of the cases, I'm sure this is a rural asset. So it serves two purposes of storing and releasing water, collecting, storing, and releasing water as, as needed. And it has the ecological function, basically, which is a consequence of storing water. So if you store water, then obviously there will be some uh, biodiversity around it, some uh, insects and some uh, wild animals will come to have the water around there and some trees will also grow. So let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so on the left hand side, uh, these are contours created on the side of a hill. Uh, so what, what, it, what does it do is it collects the water, holds a certain amount of water, and if you have enough grass and all low shrubs around there, it will ensure that to a great extent the water is held and the soil does not erode. And the whole channels, the contours that are that are constructed is done in, it's not haphazard or any way. It is done in a manner that the volume water collects and ultimately flows and generally very close to it is built a check dam. A check dam just is a barrier which doesn't allow the water to flow, which is on the right side of the uh, right side of the uh, process, right side of the uh, sorry the slide. <clears throat> then this water, what it does it, it recharges the water table, and it also provides water to farmers who can pump it out and use it for drinking purposes, uh, portable purposes, and also so much for agriculture, which you know, rural economies are so dependent on. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, so these are generally financed by government grants and philanthropies, and therefore they create resilience in the in the rural uh, pocket. So somebody might be asking, what is so green about these things? Uh, it is not so much of emissions. You might say that the water being present 
means grass grows and therefore there's a carbon sink but that's not the significant out here this is about the fact that in times of stress there will be water and therefore the agricultural season can run and therefore people have drinking water more than what they would have generally had even if it does not rain as much so this is a typical case of a resilience asset we will see another example uh, of resilience assets uh, which you know the uh, the government can then finance or refinance through green bonds the next slide please yeah and this is one example of another example of a resilience assets uh, which is uh, done in ramthal so it is a drip irrigation project the water is lifted from the river krishna you can see where ramthal is on the indian peninsula on top of this top of the slide and the same amount of water which would have irrigated 30300 uh, sorry 60000 uh, sorry 30375 acres now irrigates around 60000 acres at least twice of what it could irrigate this lifts the water and then puts it through uh, pipes, a network of HDP and PVC pipes to uh, drip irrigation systems. And there is an increase in farm yield and an added region has now become uh, very productive in terms of agriculture. So I think we have a very short uh, video also here illustrating what has happened there. Can we just play it please? Okay, thanks a lot. So I think we will now go into a short case study, which is of uh, the Indoor Municipal Corporation. So these are some of the projects which can be, uh, you know, this is in renewable energy. So let's go into the case study straight away. <coughs> uh, Indoor Municipal Corporation, yeah. So the Indoor Municipal Corporation, let's go to the next slide, please. Uh, yeah, it, uh, it spends a lot of money in pumping out water from the particular dams to the city of Indore. And it pays a uh, electricity charge, next slide please, which is around 600 and, uh, 6 rupees and 30 paisa uh, per 
uh, unit which is a high charge because this actually cross subsidizes the retail uh, subscribers now the project which is about covering a certain portion of these lakes or reservoirs with solar panels will actually result in a cash surplus every month next slide please yeah so these are some of the pros and cons which you know people can go through at, at length but let's see what are the economics and how how does it work of floating solar versus the uh, this thing solar next slide please yeah uh, so this is some of the interest so uh, at annual interest is rupees 45 crore at an interest rate of nine percent please remember these two things we'll come back to it as we look at the economics yes next slide please uh, so these are some of the specifics of the bond so let's go to the next slide these will come in the final uh, study yes this is the one so as you can see there is an outflow of a certain amount per month and uh, there is a certain savings if you go and if you look at the rec and cdm benefits of rupees 2.38 crores per month you might say that this is a bit uncertain so i have kept it in highlights so let's go to the next slide please so with the rec and cdm services and the other sinking fund which is 1.8 crores also uh, and some allowance of the government the savings comes to 12.05 crore uh, per month and after the bond has been extinguished and is 10 crore per month rupees 10 crore per month during the period of the bond now if you say that the rec cdm and the government benefits are not there then let us take off around 4 crores from there still the prof the project is profitable and gives a estimate of 6 crores per month so this is basically one project which is good and also profitable now we look at guarantees uh, so let's look at the scheme where uh, you know a lot of municipalities are not well rated so a bond guarantee can be very useful so come let's go to the next slide which explains the uh, the visual the visual please the next one please yeah so here you can see that a bond payout without a guarantee the interest rate would be high a bond guarantee would be a low and there is a certain guarantee fee which the guarantor would charge and still there is a saving so not only can you access the bond markets but you also save the next slide please yeah so these are the two entities in Asia who I'm aware uh, do bond guarantees. The USAID also does some of them, but Garantco and Dana Jami National are quite prominent. Next, please. Yeah, thank you. We are open to more questions, please. Sure, thank you so much, uh, Sandeep. So we have a um, um, couple of questions. Um, I will just read it to you. Uh, so one is on uh, does India has any experience with afforestation projects for green bonds? Mm, not yet. We are looking at some companies who are paper manufacturers who also put up forestry, but it hasn't gone uh, a lot yet. Okay. Um, sure. Um, the other one uh, is the question. Uh, if anyone else has any question, we request you to uh, kindly let us know by raising the hand. There is an icon where which you can click so that we will unmute you. Um, I think uh, there is one, Mr. Marlon. Uh, you can unmute yourself so that you can ask question. Okay. All right. Um, Sure. So there is one question to um, Alexia. Now, can or you hear me? Speakers. Yes. Yes, we can hear. Uh, you. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, we can hear you. Please uh, go. On. Okay. I have. Uh, okay. I have uh, questions right now. Um, a series of questions actually, and I hope it could be taken up. Uh, first to Alexia, uh, who are the primary audience for this uh, readiness framework, uh, and when was it last updated? Uh, does it capture all green bond issuances, including the three broad bond frameworks uh, that were mentioned? Uh, for Mr. Mihul, uh, the slides on benefits to banks and issuers is very interesting. 
has there been a survey or maybe anecdotal data on which benefits rank more heavily for them? And this is for Alexia and Mehul. Uh, for as an example, uh, what if a second tier city in the Philippines, like Iloilo City, population about 600,000, would like to float a green bond to finance a local subway or tram system? What are the first three steps they need to do to kickstart this process? They want to do it internally at first, so there's no budget for an external advisor as of the moment. Thank you. Um, Alexia, would you like to answer? Sure. Was that Marlon? Uh, yes. yes. No, this is me. <laughs> Hello, Alexia. <laughs> Hi, Marlon. <laughs> nice to hear your voice. Um, so thanks for your questions. Um, and um, I think generally, so the Green Bond Framework, we finished just last year, the roadmap. Um, it's definitely not comprehensive. So the, the universe of issuances and resources um, is, is much broader, but what we tried to do was really curate and kind of pull together a selection of resources that we thought would be um, most helpful for folks. Uh, that I'm sure, as you know, the, the Climate Bonds Initiative website is also a wealth of information. Um, and we should chat offline about opportunities to help um, municipalities advance uh, objectives related to specific projects for green bond issuances. Uh, you know, generally in the way that most of this process begins is to start doing a comprehensive kind of budget analysis. If the municipality has used bonds in the past, that obviously helps a lot um, because they already have the bond issuance structure in place. Um, but, you know, right now folks are really particularly given COVID, there's going to be increasing, I would say, investor attention on the credit worthiness of um, anyone who's issuing a bond and, and how likely they are to repay the bond um, once they issued it. And so there's, I, I would anticipate, you know, that we'll see more national level programs coming out of COVID focused on providing credit enhancements and guarantees for issuers and key markets for things that we really want to see move forward that might need a little extra help um, just because the public sector in particular is anticipated to take such a heavy revenue hit from the decline in tax revenue that's resulted from the you know essential halt of business activity in many parts of the global economy. Um, and so, uh, but you know, all that to say that I, I don't think there there's definitely opportunities to move forward with green bonds, um, and we'd be happy to to chat about whether or not there's some opportunities for collaboration with the technical assistance resources that um, the LEDS GP and UNDP have. Sure, thank you, Alexia. Would Mehul or Sandeep like to add? Uh, I think especially, uh, yes. yeah, Mehul, especially on the, uh, I think, the three steps uh, that a uh, city like Iloilo should uh, take up to kickstart the process of green bond assurance for a local subway or tram system. Uh, yeah, sure. So basically, a tram system is a type of project which generally is developed on, on, on the government budget, right? Because uh, the, the revenues from the, the, the customers or the ticket revenues are not sufficient enough to pay for the project, generally the transport projects. So you need to basically do a feasibility study on, on what is what is the type of the project, what is the alignment. And once the total cost of the, you need to determine the total cost of the project and how it would be financed, right? This is the first step on estimating the feasibility study. Second part, if you are keen on issuing a basically green bond, so, so you need to do a basically analysis on on what is the environment benefits of of a tram vis-a-vis -vis with the current mode of transportation. So it would help you to basically classify it as a green project. As a thumb rule basis, it is, but you need to have more quantitative parameters. And the third important point is when you are when you are talking of a bond, basically the project is not yet implementational. So it's it's a operation. It is a basically greenfield project. So if you want to issue project bonds then you need to ensure that how would the bond investors be repaid, right? Normally, when you use when you issue a bond, it is for eight years, 10 years, 12 years. So the interest payment would start immediately 
in the next quarter. So what is the interest payment mechanism? If it is financed through the budget, are these budgeted revenues basically escrowed and so that you get basically an investment grade credit rating? So these are the broad things that needs to be thought into. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mayor, for that. Thank you. Uh, yes, Amir, go on. Would you like to? Yeah, we, we have uh, one other question from Mr. Abu Bakr Muhammad uh, on how do you determine the carbon footprint and emission reductions in the waste management project? Mehul or uh, Sandeep, would you like to feel this? Okay, Mehul, this side. So basically, in the in the waste management projects, uh, one thing is basically if it is business as usual, what are the current uh, measures which are taken by the government in in managing the waste? For example, in the city of Ahmedabad, basically the, the dry solid waste there, there was it was not dumped into the landfill, but it was just basically dumped uh, on a site. So the negative uh, impacts on the environment are huge enough. So if you basically have a scientific way of basically managing the waste, that itself basically compensates for the for the way the current waste management practices are there. So this is one of the most important reasons basically the waste management projects classify as a basically the, the grain projects. So fundamentally what you need to do the analysis, what are the current waste management practices in place? In most of the cities, in India, uh, the waste management is not done as per the scientific standards, right? It is done. So if you basically, do, if you segregate the waste, if you first of all reduce the waste in the source itself, if you segregate the waste, recycle the waste, and then basically only a part of the portion is basically used for landfill, the, the environmental impacts of this process are huge enough to basically qualify as a green project. Thank you. Right, thank you, thank you, Mehul. Uh, I think uh, with that we have uh, come to. Yeah, I think we've addressed all the questions that have been raised by participants. Uh, we would uh, encourage you to uh, take a look at uh, the recording uh, that will be passed on to you uh, at the presentations. If there are other questions that you have uh, after uh, going through the material again, kindly feel free to write to us and we will uh, make sure that your questions are answered. For the technical assistance questions, kindly write back to the ALP Secretariat and we'll be happy to take them on, whether they are on a specific project or they're related to capacity building initiatives, uh, linked to green bonds and, uh, building, uh, and going through the different steps of issuing green bonds. We'll be happy to uh, work with you and support you. Uh, Anand, then over to, over to you for uh, closing remarks. Uh, before that, any closing remarks from our uh, panelists, please, Alexia, Mehul, and uh, Sandeep. Thank you for having us and great discussion tonight. We look forward to continued collaboration. Yeah, I would like to thank all the attendees for the wonderful physical interaction. Thank you. Sure. Uh, thank you all for attending the webinar. And uh, we take this opportunity to thank the speakers and sharing the insightful presentations. We hope the participants uh, found it useful. Uh, we will share the presentations and recording later in the ALP website. So uh, please look at uh, look for that. And we will also share it in other ALP channels. The videos that were played, the links will also be shared. And we recommend you to share these lessons widely in your circle and uh, with the peer members. Uh, you can join the uh, NDC finance communities of practice by following this link so that uh, you'll get the uh, continuous updates on the uh, communities of practice. We also encourage you to um, we also encourage the developing countries and its representatives to write to us if you need any technical assistance on green bonds or any financial related matters or other uh, low emission development strategy topics. So the Finance Corp member, uh, as you know, is member driven. The activities are planned based on members' needs and priorities. So please let us know if you have any requirements and how ALP can support you. 
and uh, finally towards end of this uh, webinar um, survey questions uh, will pop up so please take a couple of minutes to complete the feedback form this will really help us to plan our future alp activities and if you have any further um, uh, questions uh, please uh, do reach uh, to us and uh, finally a very big thank you to all the panelists and uh, the excellent interactions thank you so much have a good day